All right. So some upcoming programming that we have is uh, on Wednesdays through the month of August, uh, plus select Saturdays, we will be conducting our, our popular underground railroad walking tours through downtown Westchester. This weekend, we are also conducting our first ever stuffed animal sleepover. So if there's a child that you know who'd love to drop off their favorite toy to go on an overnight adventure at our museum, now is your chance. Our next virtual speaker series will be on Tuesday, August 23rd, and that will feature historian David Walter talking about 10 Civil War generals with ties to Chester County. I will include a link to all of those events in the chat box right after I'm done introducing our speaker today. If you have any questions tonight, please put them in the chat box and I will make sure to ask them at the end of the presentation. And finally, if you enjoy our programs, please consider becoming a member or donating to CCHC. Contrary to popular belief, we are not a government organization, but we are the caretakers of over 750,000 manuscripts, over 80,000 objects, and over 100,000 photographs. We appreciate any and all donations that help us to protect and share Chester County's remarkable history. So it looks like we have everyone here. I'm seeing those chats come in. We have people from Westchester, Lancaster, um, let's see, Mount Holly Springs, PA, McLean, Virginia, Wadesboro, North Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, wonderful, all over, Portland, Oregon. Wilmington, Delaware, Harrisburg, fantastic. Keep them coming, please do put in the chat uh, where you're viewing from and what brought you. Greensboro, North Carolina, that's excellent. And Scotland, Dr. Montagna, we've got Scotland. That's great. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be there in a month, so I, I may be looking that, per that person up. Nice, Chesapeake Bay, wonderful, excellent. Frankfurt, Germany, all right, I'm loving this. So uh, as I said, I'll include those links in the chat box, but since we have almost everyone here, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Dennis Montagna is a historian in the Northeast Region Office of the National Park Service based in Philadelphia. He is currently president of the Association for Gravestone Studies and serves on the board of the Vermont Marble Museum in Proctor, Vermont. He holds a PhD in art history from the University of Delaware with a concentration on American sculpture. So without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Montagna. Great, thank you, Jennifer. And, uh... I want to thank uh, Jennifer and th thank you for inviting me and for the uh, Chester County History Center for, for sponsoring this, this talk. I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to talking with you all. Jennifer and I had a chance to do a walkthrough at Oakland Cemetery several months ago, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty exciting place. I'm glad to be able to you know, talk to you about cemeteries in general and maybe give you different ways of thinking about your own, your own cemetery that you have in, in your midst there. Um, okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, most art and architectural historians who focus their research on cemeteries do so because of the monuments they contain. Uh, but in reality, cemeteries are landscapes in which grave monuments play a key role, but they usually play a shared role. They are components of often complex spaces that typically also include trees and other plant materials, drainage systems, systems of roads and paths, and all the various elements used to demark boundaries of grave sites and family plots. In fact, cemetery stones are sometimes not even stones at all, as these metal grave markers from Boulder and Denver, Colorado show. But no matter what they're made of, grave memorials serve as a good place for our discussion to begin. They are often compelling creations, and it is through them that most of us have become drawn to cemeteries and their preservation. In the U.S., an entire field of scholarship has grown up around the study of gravestones and their makers. It really began in earnest nearly a century ago with pioneering scholarship on the work of gravestone carvers from the 17th and 18th century by Harriet Merrifield Forbes. Subsequent key studies include 
James Dietz and Edwin Bethlefson's 1966 American Antiquity article, Death's Heads, Cherubs, and Willow Trees, Experimental Archaeology in Colonial Cemeteries. In 1977, Dietz distilled this article into a chapter of his influential book in Small Things Forgotten, The Archaeology of Early American Life. As he inventoried gravestones and tried to quantify the gradual thematic shifts of their carved motifs over time, he argued that cemetery makers, cemetery markers are key cultural artifacts that can help us to better understand the people who made them and commissioned them. While these studies focus mostly on colonial and federal era stones of Southern New England, they have led later generations of scholars to explore an ever wider temporal and geographic spectrum of cemetery monument making. Annette Stott's recent work on the tree trunk shaped Woodman of the World monuments in Colorado and Lauren Horton's examination of the cast metal grave markers that Charles Andera produced at his foundry in Iowa and shipped throughout the Midwest and Plains states have cast a light on monument making far from colonial New England. Other studies have introduced us to African-American monument makers past and present. In Markers, the Journal of the Association for Gravestone Studies, Marianne Ashcraft published her work on the beautifully conceived mid 19th century grave memorials that Sebastian Boss Hammond created in central Maryland, providing a window into the world of a once enslaved stone carver. We met 20th century gravestone maker Murray Veal through Barbara Rotundo's 1997 Markers article. Rotundo interviewed Veal and photographed many of the more than 300 cast and incised cement markers he created near Jackson, Mississippi. In recent years, I've been visiting monument maker Phil Webb in Hoisington, Kansas. For about the last decade or so, Webb has been creating painted concrete memorials to mark the graves of town residents that had been virtually unmarked. Webb researches these all but forgotten people he memorializes most online and tries to create monuments that he believes will do them justice and preserve memory of them within the community. But while many of us continue to focus upon the makers of cemetery monuments, others have begun to examine the broader cemetery landscapes into which these monuments are placed. Private and public burial grounds of the 17th and 18th centuries and the larger garden and arboretum cemeteries that developed in the years that followed provide rich source material for historians of society and culture. The garden cemetery movement was a fact of American urban life by the 1840s and 50s, and it brought about a brave new world of large burial spaces created on the outskirts of city centers. Among them is Oakland Cemetery opened in 1854, just outside the borough of Westchester. These were often highly crafted landscapes that grew from earlier enlightenment era ideas about life, death, and the importance of remembrance. And these ideas remain strongly felt today. In truth, any consideration of garden cemeteries and their importance in our national life should begin with a 72 acre Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts. No one in early 19th century America had, had ever seen a burial space like Mount Auburn. It was vast and richly landscaped, and it had a system of roads and footpaths designed to work with the naturally undulating ground upon which it was built. Within a few years, cemeteries generally pattern after Mount Auburn, but embodying the varied character of their different locales were being created throughout the East. Philadelphia's Laurel Hill Cemetery, pictured on the screen, opened in 1836. Two years later, both Greenmount Cemetery in Baltimore and Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn came into being. Still a very active cemetery, Greenwood has now interred more than 600,000 New Yorkers, my grandparents among them. By the 1840s, as Easterners, immigrant groups, and their ideas moved west, so did landscaped cemeteries. 
Cincinnati's Spring Grove opened in 1844. A generation later, Lakeview Cemetery was founded in Cleveland in 1869. At nearly 300 acres, it is four times the size of Mount Auburn and is the site of the massive mausoleum that contains the remains of President James Garfield, assassinated in 1881. But let's get back to Cambridge, Massachusetts and Mount Auburn Cemetery where ideas about picturesque rural cemeteries first took shape in the United States. More than 2000 people attended its consecration ceremony in 1831 and heard Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story describe the new cemetery that would soon dwarf the city burial grounds that Bostonians knew. His words are celebratory as he describes a landscape rich in symbolic meaning and I'll show you images from a wide array of garden cemeteries to illustrate Story's words. He said, a rural cemetery seems to combine in itself all the advantages to gratify human feelings or tranquilize human fears. And what spot can be more appropriate than, than this? Nature seems to point it out as the favorite retirement for the dead. There are around us all the varied features of her beauty and grandeur, the forest crowned height, the grassy glade and the silent grove. Here are the lofty oak, the beech, the rustling pine and the drooping willow, the tree that sheds its pale leaves with every autumn, a fit emblem of our own transitory bloom, and the evergreen with its perennial shoots instructing us that the wintry blast of death kills not the buds of virtue. All around us, there breathes a solemn calm, as if we were in the bosom of a wilderness. Ascend but a few steps, and what a change of scenery to surprise and delight us. In an instant, we pass from the confines of death to the bright and balmy regions of life. Below us flows the winding river with its rippling current, like the stream of time hastening to the ocean of eternity. We stand, as it were, upon the borders of two worlds, and we may gather lessons of profound wisdom by contrasting the one with the other, or indulge in the dreams of hope and ambition, or solace our hearts by melancholy mediations. The voice of consolation will spring up in the middle of the silences of these regions of death. The hand of friendship will delight to cherish the flowers and the shrubs that fringe the lowly grave or the sculptured monument. Spring will invite the footsteps of the young by its opening foliage and autumn detain the contemplative. Here, let us erect the memorials of our love and our gratitude and our glory. For Story and others, the new cemeteries were more than just places in which to bury the dead. They were places of sanctuary where the living could go to be consoled, to be inspired, to be renewed. They were places that were at once private and public, where families could perform domestic rituals of remembrance and where the public could come together to mourn communal loss. These thoughts about the symbolic meanings of nature and its ability to nurture the mind and soul did not just occur to Story on his four mile carriage ride from the center of Boston that September morning in 1831. His words were the product of, near, product of nearly 200 years of Western thought on life, death, the sanctity of nature, and the importance of creating tangible remembrances of those who are gone from our lives. If we look to the writings of English and French theorists of the 17th and 18th centuries, we can find the seeds that germinated and came to fruition in the cemeteries designed in the 19th and 20th. Writing to a friend in 1675, garden designer John Evelyn wrote that a well-planned garden could foster meditation and lead the human spirit to virtue and sanctity, contributing to what he called contemplative and philosophical enthusiasm. Soon a host of social theorists and poets were writing that a properly crafted landscape could evoke insight and profound spiritual emotions. Design 
country estate landscapes like this one at Stourhead, west of London, began appearing in the 1740s. Punctuated with neoclassical temples, grottos, quiet bodies of reflective water, gentle streams, long vistas and meandering paths. Places like this provided their wealthy owners with asylum from the hurly-burly of urban politics and commerce. By the mid 18th century, English landscape gardens like the one Sir Richard Temple built at Stowe, his estate in Buckinghamshire, were being des designed for the enrichment of not just the wealthiest elites, but also for a somewhat broader audience as well. Probably the most famous of the English gardens, Stowe became a destination for public visits, a pre-Disney experience that occasioned the building of nearby inns to serve the, to serve the tourist trade that the site inspired. While most English estate gardens were not burial sites, some were. The most famous of these was the garden at Castle Howard with its imposing hilltop family mausoleum. Built in 1742, its palatial beauty inspired Horace Walpole to, to suggest that it might tempt people to want to be buried alive. Breaking in dramatic fashion from the tradition of church-connected burials, Castle Howard's mausoleum helped to usher in a taste for mausoleum building throughout the English countryside during the late 18th century. The English style of landscape garden design easily jumped across the English Channel and gained popularity in France during the last decades of the 18th century. The most well-known and frequently visited of France's English-inspired landscapes was Hermonville, a 2,100-acre site about 30 miles northeast of Paris. The garden's owner and designer, René de Girardin, went to great lengths to create the proper setting to reflect upon nature, mortality, and antiquity. He even installed dead trees to inspire a melancholy mood. The philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau spent the last six weeks of his life there in 1778, and was buried on an island at the site. His grave was initially marked by a small neoclassical monument surmounted by an urn, but this was soon replaced by a more ambitious marble sarcophagus in 1780. The creation of a harmonious connection between the grave monument and its naturalistic landscape would inspire the designers of public cemeteries a few decades later. By 1804, ideas derived from English estate gardens combined with a Parisian need to develop more adequate burial space for the French capital. The result was Père Lachaise Cemetery, opened on the site of an old Jesuit monastery outside of town. While most Americans know Père Lachaise as the burial site of rock musician Jim Morrison of the Doors, the cemetery is probably the best known landscape cemetery in Europe. In its expansive scale, more than in its specific design, it served as a point of inspiration for Mount Auburn and other American cemeteries created throughout the 19th century. In general, by the middle, middle decades of the 19th century, American garden cemeteries had become well-established places to visit and enjoy. They also became places where people could mourn together and reflect upon both public and private meanings of loss and sacrifice. Many planners and operators of these cemeteries believed that well-crafted memorial landscapes would also help to inspire greater patriotism and respect for the nation's institutions. Laurel Hill Cemetery's Mercer gravesite fits squarely within this tradition. In 1840, the Philadelphia chapter of the St. Andrews Society exhumed the body of General Hugh Mercer, killed at the Battle of Princeton in 1777, and had it reburied at Laurel Hill. While it created a site of patriotic remembrance, the reburial also brought notoriety to a new cemetery intent on selling internment space. A generation later, the Civil War presented rich opportunities to, to memorialize heroes in a landscape setting. You are all familiar with the standard Civil War soldiers monuments that were built throughout the late 19th century. The standing figure of a soldier on a low base or a tall column can be found in public parts at parks and on countless courthouse grounds throughout the nation. Sometimes it's a well-proportioned granite figure, 
like this example from Camden, Maine. At other times, it's an equally well-made cast zinc figure that has been painted to look like bronze, like these two New York examples. The one on the left is from Cuyahoga Lake. The other is in Saratoga Springs. But more typically, we see fairly perfunctory and lifelike, lifeless productions like these two stone monuments. But whether well-conceived or not, this became the standard formula for remembering soldier dead. But how did this become the standard? What were the sources of this flood of monuments? We can look to our developing garden cemeteries for the answer. Among the very earliest of these soldier monuments was the one commissioned by Cincinnati Spring Grove Cemetery in 1863, while the fighting still raged. American sculptor Randolph Rogers, working in his studio in Rome, created a figure called the Sentinel, a Union soldier on guard with his musket at the ready. While he worked on the figure, an English visitor asked Rogers if it portrayed the South's great martyr General Stonewall Jackson, whom she had heard so much about. In a very matter of fact manner, Rogers, a supporter of the Union cause said, no madam, it's the man who shot Stonewall Jackson. The bronze figure was cast in Munich and became a focal point of the cemetery when it was installed near a section of soldier burials in 1865. Martin Milmore was another sculptor who received a very early commission to create a soldier monument, this time marking the burial site of 39 soldiers at Forest Hills Cemetery in the Roxbury section of Boston. Instead of a soldier at the ready, the 23-year-old Milmore rendered a figure he called the citizen soldier resting on his musket and solemnly reflecting upon the loss of fellow soldiers buried in the cemetery lot just below him. The memorial was designed in 1867 and dedicated the following year on the first formal observance of Memorial Day. Even memorials to Civil War dead that are essentially private take on a broader civic significance when families decide to make clear the specific details of their loss. And these, de and these details would have resonated with a public that was very knowledgeable about the history of the war that they had all endured. These two grave monuments are found at Oakland Cemetery. The marble cross on a multi-level base on the left remembers 24-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Thomas S. Bell, killed in Maryland at the Battle of Antietam on September 17, 1862, the bloodiest single day of fighting during the Civil War. The granite monument on the right marks the grave of Sergeant William M. Baltz. He survived the fighting at Antietam, but died the following spring at Salem Church during the Battle of, of Chancellorsville in Virginia. But our cemeteries have been the sites of public mourning that go beyond remembering soldier dead. Brooklyn's Greenwood Cemetery played a key civic role when a theater fire killed 278 people in 1876. A mass grave marked by a granite obelisk became the final resting place for 103 of the victims whose caskets radiated out from the center of the lot. When a school fire in Collinwood, a suburb of Cleveland killed 175 children and teachers in 1908, nearly half of those in the building that day, Lakeview Cemetery donated a site for the burial of the 19 students whose bodies could not be identified. A tall granite stele at the gravesite keeps alive the memory of those who died. While it is somewhat disfigured by corrosion and stands in need of conservation, the bronze panel depicts an angel whose outstretched wings envelop the children that surround her. Today, we're more prone to create memorials at the actual places of public tragedy than at the burial places of its victims. We've seen recent examples as ambitious as the memorial marking the Oklahoma City bombing site on the left, and as intimate as a roadside memorial marking a life lost near Newark, Delaware. Cemetery memorials to the victims of modern tragedies recall individual lives, as did those private memorials to Civil War soldiers at Oakland's. And sometimes they do so with overt reference to the circumstances of their deaths, but sometimes they don't. Brooklyn's Greenwood Cemetery 
interred the remains of 47 victims of the World Trade Center attack, and those grave sites command both public and family attention. On the left, Vernon Cherry's monument notes his September 11th death date and includes a photo of him in his fire department uniform, but it makes no further reference to the World Trade Center attack that claimed his life. Michael Bocchino's monument, on the other hand, includes a long inscription about his death and its national significance. But the principal 9-11 memorials are located at the crash sites, not in cemeteries. These memorials make specific reference to individual deaths, much as a cemetery memorial would, but their focus is, is not private. Instead, they are decidedly national and public in nature. The memorial benches at the Pentagon, one for each of the 184 victims, are arranged by the age of the dead. The direction of, of the bench, either facing toward the building or away from it, tells us if the victim died in the building or on the plane. The memorial at the World Trade Center site carries bronze panels with the names and affiliations of each victim. These are national memorials, but ones that have been personalized. It seems likely that most communal grieving will continue to take place at the sites of trauma rather than at the more politically neutral grounds of remembrance that cemeteries provide. But it's important to remember that with their park-like landscapes, their memorials to war dead and local tragedies, cemeteries have been and often remain profoundly public spaces in which communities grieved, remembered, and enjoyed the consoling beauty of the natural setting that surrounded them. But as we celebrate the public nature of cemeteries, we should also consider their very private and personal aspects as well. While they are vast landscapes, they are also collections of smaller domestic spaces, like this one, a private lot enclosed by a cast iron fence and entrance gate. Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge once had more than a thousand cast iron enclosures. It now has fewer than 40. While anecdotal evidence often suggests that many of these disappeared during wartime scrap drives, many were probably removed in an effort to eliminate the maintenance effort that they required. Stone supports and iron railings were also commonly used to define a family's burial lot, as seen in this example at Oakland's. Typically, we find a sizable central monument surrounded by smaller ones that marks the graves of individual family members. Another means of defining family spaces, especially at the end of the 19th and into the 20th centuries, involved the use of stone curbing that would not require the scraping and painting needed for the, cast, needed, uh, for the care of cast iron. Also at Oakland Cemetery, we find a very unusual stone enclosure at the Bolt slot. Its fortress-like design is decidedly military in nature and speaks to the family's desire to display its Civil War service and sacrifice. Over the years, many of these enclosures have also been lost. You see an intact enclosure at Swan Point Cemetery in Providence, Rhode Island, and evidence of a now missing one at Laurel Hill Cemetery in Philadelphia. The advent of riding mowers and, and the desire to reduce the cost of large maintenance staffs has usually led to a search for ways to simplify through removal, the landscape being managed. But what is being lost as landscapes are simplified? The elements that help to mark these as private spaces within a larger public landscape. Lost are the planted urns and cast iron benches that families once ordered from catalogs and brought to their lots, seen in this ad from the Monumental News in 1898. A late 19th century photo from Mount Auburn shows these adornments when they remained in place and created an outdoor room. Time and the disappearance of the families who buried their dead in our historic cemeteries have allowed us to lose sight of what these places meant and how they were used. What were once private spaces where families carried out their own rituals of remembrance have become mute devoid of the boundaries that once defined them. Moreover, they have lost the evidence of the hands that ornamented them, and we have lost the ability to discern that these were often private garden spaces that families planted and tended. 
while we can't really recreate the ways people use these memorial spaces, we can try to better understand the life of these places through photographs that document their use and appearance. These are taken from stereo pairs, likely commissioned by the families depicted in them. They provide literal snapshots of 19th century mourning rituals and the people who perform them. Understanding what historic cemeteries meant to those who created and used them inevitably makes us think about how, how they've changed over time. Managing that change is probably the biggest challenge for those, of today, for those who are today's stewards of these landscapes. Accommodating new burials in an established historic cemetery presents questions. When do new monuments become intrusive in an historic landscape? In the 1960s, Brooklyn's Greenwood Cemetery created new burial space in some of its oldest historic sections, resulting in a more densely built up landscape and a sometimes dis disjointed mix of old and new monuments. But something much more drastic occurred at Kensal Green, a large cemetery in suburban London. Opened in 1831, it has the curving roads, rich horticulture, and impressive monuments that made it a jewel of early 19th century English cemeteries. But a desire to eke out more burial space and preserve an income stream has led to a decision to bury beneath the cemetery's broad paths, turning roadways into footpaths and destroying a key element of the landscape. Most often, losses of cemetery landscapes are, are not tied to something as proactive as a search for more burial space. They result from an inability to provide grounds maintenance because they're not taking in enough money to cover their costs. Often these losses are subtle, embodied by an encroaching tree in need of pruning at the left. Sometimes they're quite dramatic, as in this view of a vine covered section of Philadelphia's virtually abandoned Mount Vernon Cemetery. Beneath each of those vine covered bumps is a monument. Views like these show us that if we are to preserve these memorial landscapes, manager, managers of historic cemeteries will need to secure the financial wherewithal and forge the community partnerships that will be required to preserve a healthy balance between, between the memorials we've built and the landscapes into which we've placed them. It's readily apparent when cemetery management has achieved success in its efforts to maintain horticulture and monuments in equilibrium. 50 years ago, the staff at Philadelphia's Laurel Hill Cemetery could barely keep the grass mowed. Today, it is a place that feels very much pulled together and under control. At Mount Vernon Cemetery, after years of neglect, a group of volunteers has begun to clear the tangle of trees, brush, and vines that have overwhelmed it. Located just across Ridge Avenue from Laurel Hill, Mount Vernon is poised to make its way back from the abyss. Earlier this summer, a nascent friends group there offered its first tour of the cemetery as they try to build a constituency for the site's preservation. And on the map, you see on the left, you can see Laurel Hill Cemetery on the left side, Ridge Avenue, and, on, and then on the right is Mount Vernon Cemetery. At Laurel Hill Cemetery, Christ Church Burial Ground in Center City, Evergreen Cemetery in Portland, Maine, and now at Mount Vernon, preservationists are trying to build advocacy for these at-risk landscapes by using methods gleaned from the world of museums and more traditional historic sites. Conducting public tours like the one Jennifer Green conducted at Oakland's this past Saturday, working with local schools to develop curricula, and crafting stories to make the dead and their times come alive have all helped to introduce our historic cemeteries to a new public. But building interest in historic cemetery spaces is one thing, monetizing that interest is a tougher nut to crack. In essence, today's cemetery stewards are trying to find new constituencies to replace the ones who have gone away, to build communities that will embrace and celebrate historic cemeteries and provide the funds needed to help preserve these important public spaces. Thank you. And I, uh, I put the, uh, the, the uh, website for the Association of Gravestone Studies. Uh, we always invite people to, to join our organizations. We're an international organization and we have, I guess, about a thousand members. And we have a conference somewhere in the, 
uh, in the United States or Canada every year and hopefully overseas at some point soon as well. So anyway, thank, thank you very much. And again, Jennifer, thank you for, for inviting me. And I'm, I'm happy to, for you to mine that, uh, that chat for, for any questions <laughs> or comments. So I want to thank you first and foremost. I encourage anybody, if you have any um, questions that you would specifically like to ask about cemeteries, about their designs, or about their preservation, please do put them in the chat box. Um, we do have a couple questions, and I want to, uh, Dr. Montagna, thank you for giving us, the Chester County History Center, the shout out for our first walking tour of historic Oakland Cemetery, which was this past Saturday. And it's something that we hope to be able to continue for years to come. It benefited both CCHC as well as the Oakland Cemetery uh, Perpetual Care Fund. So hopefully we can start to address some of those financial difficulties that these historic cemeteries uh, struggle with. So one question that we had was, um, Several, several cemeteries have robust volunteer forces, but what are some resources for financial stability for historic cemeteries? I know you mentioned um, like tours and things like that, but are there funds, foundations and things that cemeteries can apply for? Yeah, there's, um, there aren't a lot of options. I mean, the, the, um, I work for the federal government, so I always have to say, first of all, we, we, we don't have money that we give that we give out, but the, the federal government provides funding to state preservation offices and state preservation offices offices often um, will will support cemetery projects, sometimes planning grants to try to to move a preservation effort forward. Um, often sometimes bricks and mortar, you know, but not 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 usually. Um, mining sort of found foundations. These are very um, th these are projects that have a lot of interest among foundations because they're very public oriented um, and and uh, it, it usually is not that hard to sell. But the real challenge is really the maintenance over time. Uh, and that's the thing that really sort of brings people up short because you know you can do and go in and do a preservation effort. You know, uh, we, we the Association of Graveyard Studies has um, workshops and we, we teach people how to do pretty simple cemetery preservation work like straightening gravestones and simple cleaning and things like that. But um, there really needs to be a commitment to making sure that that happens, that, you know, maintenance, it's not a one shot thing. And maintenance really, you have to build in uh, ongoing maintenance. And with a lot of these cemeteries, especially ones like say Mount Vernon, it's hard because they're they're so far they're so far gone. Um, so it takes more to really bring bring them back and really keep them. Uh, Mount uh, Mount Moriah Cemetery in Philadelphia is another example of this, where they've had a very dedicated group of volunteers who've been able to raise some funds and have been doing cleaning, have been doing clearing, and have actually launched a, an, a project to um, restore their 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 administration building. You know, which which required significant funds, but see, they built that ask on the back of about a decade or so of, of work of bringing the cemetery back. So, you know, they were able, to, funders were able to see that they were serious about what they were doing and, and that they, they they knew how to go about building, building it, so. Excellent. Um, Joy asked, uh, are there resources to contact for help in the very initial stages of trying to restore cemeteries? Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk to, any, to anybody. And, yeah, <laughs> Aside so, from yeah. the Association of Gravestone Studies. Yeah, obviously. and actually, well, you know, <laughs> both, actually both, both hats I wear, because, you know, I'm, in addition to the Gravestone Grace, Grace Studies, I'm, um, I, I run the, uh, a program with the Park Service called the Monument Research and Preservation Program. And basically it's a program that provides technical assistance to people who wanna conserve um, resources. And um, it's, it's, it's monuments and memorials, but I, I'll tell you whenever, you know, I kind of gauge the program by what do people want when the phone rings. And um, we have, a, most of what we're doing is really some cemetery preservation at this point. That's a lot of the advice and counsel that we give. So, you know, as I say, I'm happy to talk to folks and, I'll, and point you in directions of, who could come in if, and sort of run cemetery preservation efforts? Um, there are, you know, a number of, of really good qualified people. I, I, I have kind of a list. Uh, I don't sort of recommend one individual ever, but you know, there are a list of people who have have good background in, uh, especially working with, with with volunteers. And a lot of volunteers can do a lot. And the important thing is knowing sort of what can volunteers do safely, 
and what do you really need to bring in a, a professional for uh and, and they're you know and i as far as preservation i always believe preservation begins at home and like you have to keep yourself preserved before you because preserve anything else um but anyway so yeah so that it's really important to to work with with people who can um who, who can say sh safely show you how to do things and also mm -hmm. really encourage people not to bite off more than they can chew don't try to reset gravestones all by yourself no no <laughs> because they're very very heavy the granite is about oh probably about 175 pounds per cubic foot and you figure so you know you multiply it over the space of a monument and you've got some really big, and they believe me um a stone will change your life in a, in a moment and you know and it's very it's it's so i mean things like very small tablet stones sometimes you can sort of straighten those and reset those yourselves but um but yeah mostly we're, we're using lift lifting equipment um whether it's a like a tripod lift or sometimes gantries with a with a, with a dolly that that moves moves across a, a a track for some of the larger ones so yeah it's there there's there's a lot there's a lot to it um but it's important i think to be able to teach people how to do things that they can do safely and uh you know cleaning is one of these we don't really advocate cleaning for the sake of cleaning but you know, there are a number of monuments that are sort of covered with with like and you can't read them anymore. So, you know, if a monument isn't serving the purpose it was created for, you know, that's that's sort of a, a good reason to look and they're very there's some very safe, very gentle ways of of, um, of cleaning monuments that we have now. Faith asked a very interesting question. Um, monuments and statues have a great story, but can you say something about paupers, graves or potter's fields? Yes, um, that's a that's a particular interest I, of, of mine. I, I, um, I'm really interested in, in uh, especially mental institution cemeteries. And there's been quite a bit, a bit of interest in that recently. Um, and also sort of these are either sometimes not marked and sometimes very, very minimally marked. Um, sometimes with just, um, with just a small stone that might have a number on it. And that number usually ties into a list of people uh, and it, that list of people is usually gone. So, you know, a lot of times we're not, we're sort of dissociated the graves from the, pe the people who they're, and there, 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 there are privacy issues too around that too, especially with, with, uh, with mental institution burials. Um, yeah, there's the whole, there's a lot of interest really around forgotten people and, you know, and sort of trying to bring humanity to people who have been forgotten. In Philadelphia, um, a few years ago, um, there were, I think, 100, 1,500 sets of cremated remains that the city of Philadelphia had been stockpiling. Um, basically, you when know, they knew who who they are, these are people who maybe died died alone, died on the street, died, you know, there, but never had anybody to come and claim them, and they've been stockpiling these. Eventually, they just made an arrangement with Laurel Hill Cemetery. They created an underground space, um, almost like a series of almost filing cabinets un underground and, and a memorial. So they were able to get, um, to have a burial, to have some kind of a, a respectful uh, burial, but also that if anybody comes forward in the future, they can find individual sets of, of remains. So they haven't foreclosed the possibility of family members coming forward and, and, and claiming them. But a lot of cities, a lot of, you know, people are thinking about this a lot now, you know, people who either forgotten, who disappeared into mental mental institutions and were never seen again. Uh, a lot of interest around, and uh, you know, really good work done around re rep repatriating um, Native American children who died in, in the in, in the Indian schools, both in Canada and, and in the U.S. And I know that the, the we've we've, we've uh, re rep repatriated a number of of, of remains, um, you know, back to back west, back to the to the lands that these kids came came from. So yeah, there's there's quite a bit of interest in in that, and uh, I'm happy I'm happy to be happy to talk to to the to the questioner uh, at, at at greater length about all of that. Um, we have another question that is famous. Uh, family cemeteries are hard to find records on or have no stones. Can you suggest ways to find records? And they are specifically referring to the Cheney Family Cemetery. So are there good resources for records for family cemeteries? Um, it depends on the size of the of the cemetery and whether or not, um, I mean, oftentimes there, there, there aren't. And if, if records haven't survived either in the family or been donated to an historical society, and sometimes they have been, 
um, there really isn't isn't you know sometimes there 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 isn't very very much. Um, but then you know other ways of trying to to get at them. Sometimes you know you can get at them through through, through death death certificates. Um, so you know you there are other ways of like reconstructing because I mean it's not unusual even in bigger cemeteries for records to have gone away. You know either they weren't being cared for or they're in a building that burned down and and all of this. So um, the thing is to really try to figure out other other directions that you can you can ap approach that. And so bur burial sort of I mean so death 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 certificates tend to be a really a really good way to do it um sometimes they list you know oftentimes they will list where someone's buried um so you can you can hit you can hit it hit it that way but you know unless people have donated records to a to a to a, a repository it's it's very hard we have a couple questions about specific uh cemeteries so we're going to um i'm going to quiz you on how many cemeteries you visited dr montagna <laughs> So the one question, uh, Laura asks, are you familiar with Brandywine Cemetery in Wilmington, Delaware? It fits your description of park-like. And she also asked about Harmony Cemetery outside of Washington, Delaware. Okay, are you Brand familiar with either of those? I am uh, with, with, with Brandywine, I am familiar with, not Harmony though. So I'll have to put that on, on my list. <laughs> I, I have a big list. I, I, I chip away at it now and again, but uh, but I, I do have a, I do a, there's some big cemeteries that I mean my my cemetery mafia friends can't believe that some of the cemeteries that I haven't been to, you know, so we all have, you know, we all have these little secrets of like, you know, oh my God, you haven't been to Cave Hill in Kentucky yet. I mean, that, that kind of stuff. I but believe I asked you that. <laughs> you did. Yeah, that's what I had. That's why I had Cave Hill on the mind, I think. So. Yeah, but yeah, um, but no, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with with, 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 with Harmon. Now, tell me, where, where again is that located? It says Washington, Delaware. Okay, yeah, no, so. it's not one I know. I, you know, I, um, I, I, I did my 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 doctorate down at the University of Delaware, um, but I wasn't plumbing the, the depths of cemeteries at at the time. So there 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 are a lot down in in in, in Delaware that I haven't haven't seen. Um, in terms of family cemeteries, you go you go down downstate Delaware, and and there are a large number of both church and and and, and family family cemeteries. So. Um. Barbara says, when are you coming to Midland Cemetery? <laughs> Thank you. You have invitations to a variety that's, of cemeteries now. That's great. You know? <laughs> Maybe if we, when we get some that are close together, I can I can I can pack them pack them together. You know, I you know, as you might imagine, I mean I, to me the greatest fun is going going to some cemeteries and and invariably, anytime I go to a cemetery, there's always something that I see and I say, Gosh, you know, I've never seen that before. Oh, there's always something that you just haven't seen. Like when we when we toured Oakland's, mm -hmm. that 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 whole crenellated um, family lot that had the very military feel. I've never seen that before. I've never seen that particular thing before. So yeah, there's always something. You know, there's always something. So so cemeteries always have something exciting to offer. You know, um, and then actually when when my kids were were little and I would drag them around to to, to cemeteries. I think when my my son was, oh, I don't even think he was, he was like a year and a half or something. And I was away on a trip and, you know, we, he was riding in the car seat at the, at the back of the car and, and we, my wife was driving him by a cemetery and he pointed at the cemetery and he said, daddy, <laughs> you know, so, so that was, yeah. So I, I'm sure I've, I've scarred them both in certain ways, but you know, it's like, you know, you just, they get to see what you're interested in. So, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Um, let's see. So I, one of the other questions was, did you see any unique monuments at Oakland's? So you just mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's surround. And then I thought, I mean, the other thing I thought was, I was really moved by, and I thought it was, it was really interesting. I'm sure you, you, it was one of the, it was on, on your list when you were showing is the, um, that, 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 that paired, that paired memorial, one of which is a grave and one of which is not. Yes, you know, I um, that was mm -hmm. yeah. So there was there for those of you who might want to do the walking tour. There was there were two plots that were purchased for um, for a couple, and one of them ended up never being used, which is kind of a yeah. sad story. But well, and it was it was Samuel Samuel Barber. Right? Samuel Barber, that's and, right, and, America's and, greatest and, composer. And, and then John, the other site was in memory of a friend, and it was mm -hmm. John John Carlo Manotti. Yes. You know, and they had a, yes. a, a long, long relationship and it really mm -hmm. sort of tortured 
torture. And so, I mean, so within, you know, within that burial site, you know, you can, there are whole stories and there are whole stories about people's lives and, and what they had gone through. Yeah. Uh, and there, it's all, it's all present there, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's all present. Um, so Laura, when she was asking about the Harmony Cemetery, she reframed her question and it wasn't Washington, Delaware, it's Washington, DC. Oh. And she wanted to ask if you knew anything about gravestones that were sold. Gravestones that were sold to, pl to be placed or gravestones, existing ones that were sold like away? I'm guessing existing ones that were sold away. Okay. Um, but mm. I can also have, I can give you her contact information. And that would be great. Yeah, yeah no, I'm happy <laughs> to talk about that. I actually lived in DC for, for, for three years and I, I, that's not a cemetery that I, that I, that I knew. So um, I would definitely would, would love to, to, to know more about that and to know specifically about what, what she's referring to. So excellent. it sounds like a good story, you know? So. <laughs> anyway. All right. If there are no other questions, I'm just double checking the chat here to make sure I didn't miss any. I don't think I missed any. So thank you all for attending this evening. Thank you, Dr. Montagna, for providing not only providing our talk here tonight, but also for walking around Oakland Cemetery in Westchester with me and, you know, enjoying the nice autumnal breeze. And I do encourage you go to go seek out your local cemeteries, your rural cemeteries, even ones that maybe look like they're struggling a little bit and see what you can do to help either with mowing or financial support. These cemeteries desperately need that assistance. So please do um, be proactive and ask how you can help. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. I want to once again thank our sponsor, Haverford Trust, for making this and all of our speaker series lectures possible. This presentation has been recorded and I will send out a link to the recording within the next 24 hours. So please look for an email from me. Um, have a wonderful evening and, uh, and hopefully we'll see you at the History Center or Oakland Cemetery soon. So thank you everyone. Have a good night. Thank good you, night. Dr. Montagna. Take care. Good night. Thank you.